going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. We rely on Metro. Never had to use it before unless I wanted to come downtown. I cannot imagine what people who are in worse predicaments than me financially are going to be going through if they do a rate hike. After weeks of debate, Cincinnati City Council adopted a budget this past week, but it hardly settled all the issues. The future of Metro, for example, is looming out there in the short term. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Last Wednesday, Cincinnati City Council adopted a budget in the face of tough financial constraints. Some of the money for the social service agencies that the mayor had proposed eliminating completely uh, was restored, but only by using a questioned new mechanism. Although it may seem council has achieved closure, Mayor Lucan suggested this budget might survive only a matter of months, forcing city council to revisit some contentious issues before the fall election. The person at the center of the budget deliberations has been council member John Cranley, the chairman of the council finance committee. John, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thanks for having me. Okay. Let's, uh, we've been dealing with this budget now for about a month. This is the third show I've done on this. Uh, one of the things that was out there in the original proposal by the mayor uh, was, were things like um, eliminating snow removal from residential streets. Now, realistically, that seemed to me to politically be dead on arrival. I mean, you weren't, that was something you could just restore, right? Absolutely, and we did, yeah. uh, and we're very happy about that. I, you know, I live in Price Hill, and on my street is very hilly, and many, many people in the city, the city of Seven Hills, live in a similar predicament, and it's a core service of the city to help people get to work. So. I mean, what, did the mayor put that in there just so you guys could put something back? I mean, really, I, let's be you know, realistic. In fairness, in fairness to the mayor, uh, the, the amount of snow we've had in the last five years, is, as it does every year, varies wildly. I know. And so their argument was it was consistent with the lower snowfall year. And what we did was we took the average of five years and we set it back at the average of five years. Okay, the Farmer's Almanac rules again. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> now moving on to tougher things, and yeah. that was the social service spending. Right. Um, how did you solve this? The mayor proposed removing 4.8 million. Right. What's your what? What did you come back and do? What we did is, it was a, to give you background. There was a clear majority of city council that wanted to restore some of that funding to serve the neediest people in our city, and I'm proud that that that, that and I was part of that majority. I was proud to be part of that. And there was a variety of proposals to do so. Ultimately, we, we figured out a way to take $2 million from the general fund. It used to be close to 4.8, almost $5 million. So, we, so that's a significant reduction to right. the general fund. And we were also able to take a half a million dollars from federal block grants that are specifically designed to help low-income individuals. So I also think that makes a lot of sense, too. So the net total was $2.5 million that we were able to restore to help the disabled, the poor, the elderly. Now, last week I yeah. had Neil Tillo and Mike Bob Meekham on the show talking about, uh, from social service agencies, talking about how this, they were hoping to, to, that the council was going to be able to restore some and they were hoping for that two and a half million as a, as a basic goal, sort of a, but they are also, they have some ideas about how to save some money by coordinating right. services, by uh, eliminating some administrative costs in small agencies. And they were saying to get that accomplished, though, council was also going to have to set some priorities. These are the social services we want money to be spent for, and we want this much for youth services, right. this much for... Did council do that? Not a, Yes and no. We didn't, we didn't go so far as to... First of all, the, the social services that were affected had been told months ago that they were going to be funded, then were told that they weren't going to be funded. So they're on a very tight... They have to make employment decisions whether almost all of them are getting less money and there's a whole slew of organizations that are completely zeroed out in this budget. So they had to make very quick decisions. So what we did is we decided to actually uh, fund those organizations that we knew had a track record of, of doing well. The bigger point is that there are probably, and it may not be a politically correct thing to say, too many of these organizations out there. And what we want to do is make sure that every dollar we spend as quickly as possible gets to help those that are in need. 
And so I think reducing overhead by consolidating some of these organizations is in order in, in many ways. And in effect, this forces This forces their hands. But it's, it's going to take a while to work that all absolutely. out. Absolutely. Now, one of the things, one of the pieces of that puzzle, as you yeah. mentioned, was $2 million in the general fund. Right. And a lot of that was linked to a particular approach that's a little controversial, and let's take a look at some of this. Uh, critical to balancing the Cincinnati budget is new revenue stream from traffic cameras like these in Dayton, Ohio. But some council members question whether they will generate the projected funds. A speeding ticket is $104 currently. Out of that ticket, $10 goes to the courts, $3 to legal research, $2 to security fee, $9 to victim crime fund, $15 goes to the state of Ohio, $45.50 goes to traffic costs, leaving a revenue source of only $19.50. We currently split that with the county. However, if we went to cameras, we wouldn't split it. So we'll take $19.50. That means that we must issue night over 1900 tickets per week we must collect on those tickets $38,000 per week and by the end of the year in order to fund human services we must ticket and collect 102,564 tickets in order to reach two million dollars to fund human services that's a tough analysis is it correct unfortunately not the the vice mayor is an excellent debater and uh, I think she was arguing, given our past and how t uh, part our speeding tickets work, unfortunately, uh, good for the city and, and, and defeats the analogy. We, in the process of this red light thing, which is definitely something that I'm not 100% comfortable with, uh, is part of a compromise that we put together. Uh, and by the way, we did not specifically designate that the human services be funded from these speeding tickets. It just goes to the general fund. It goes to the general fund like everything else, and it's true that it's an unpredictable revenue stream, but so is our, in, our income tax. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, fact is that we have decriminalized these speeding tickets, okay? So if you get one of these tickets, you will not get points on your license, which I think is a huge help for insurance rates to people. You do have to pay the ticket, obviously. Uh, but because we've decriminalized it, we actually get to take the entire amount of the ticket. So it's not shared through the court system. No. So she had it down to about 20% on the do 20. You know, if it's a $100 ticket, we, right. you're only getting 20 cent, 20 percent of it. In fact, we get 100 percent of it. Uh, having said that, there are a lot of issues here. I, I did not originally propose uh, this solution. Uh, I managed a process in which I was willing to accept the compromise. How quickly can the system even be put out there so that there's a revenue stream? The, the admi that's another good point. First of all, it's important to point out that the administration's budget actually had this technology in it, and so they were intending to go forward with it regardless of what city council did. Um, but they expected to be up and running by June. How many of these cameras are going to be out there, and maybe more importantly, how is a decision made where they go, what neighborhoods they go in, because that affects who gets, who gets hit here? Correct. Uh, we don't know yet because we're just now sending out the RFP to get all this information. And based on the response to that RFP, we're going to be able to make a determination of how many and where and whatnot. And, of course, all of that uh, will and should be uh, debated publicly and, and will be. Do you imagine these things to be, they won't be on the expressways, right? Correct. Because that's not the city, city can't do that. Right. This is going to, do you imagine them on major streets, major intersections where you're already having problems? Is there a component of traffic control and safety here, or is this just a revenue stream? Let's be honest about no, it. No, I, I believe it is. A, look, it's a new thing, and we've got to try it out, and there may be problems with it, uh, and, and I'm willing to reevaluate it later. But having said that, it is a public safety tool. It, it is also, as, as I pointed out, it is also a fact that if we use it for public safety, it will generate revenue. Now, it's a fact that the federal government budgets every year what, how much money they're going to collect from cigarette taxes. Okay? It's a fact that we, as we've had for, since the beginning of parking tickets, we budget for a certain amount of revenue of, that is, we know to be roughly reliable. You know how much I'm going to pay Right, year. for parking tickets. So it is merely a fact that if we try this technology, it will generate revenue. And they, our, the finance department estimated conservatively it would generate $2 million. 
We'll have to find out. And if, okay. it, do, if it doesn't generate $2 million, we'll have to make uh, adjustments. Let's shift over. <laughs> I just want to say, and yeah. you know this, that yeah. I also invite a representative from Metro to be here this yeah. morning. They're in labor negotiations uh, and said that they had a conflict of, of schedule this right. morning, plus um, they're not ready to talk about this, I don't think, really publicly. But be that as it may. Now, at certain times in my life, including this past year, for, for medical reasons, I haven't been allowed to drive. I've been on Metro f for three months at a time, so I know the system. I care about the system. What do you got against Metro? What's going on here? I don't have... <laughs> uh, I, what I want to do, l l big picture, <clears throat> right now, Metro is proposing to raise dramatically the rates that people pay to ride the bus. For the average folk, it's about 50% increase. For the disabled, uh, it, it spans from 100% to 300% increase over the last 18 months. 18 months ago, it cost a dollar for someone who was disabled to take the bus. If these rates go into effect, most of those riders will pay $3. That's a 300% increase in less than 18 months. You take that, for, ride two directions a day, $4 a day, $20 a week, $1,000 a year. Most folks that say have Down syndrome make minimum wage. L this is 5%, this would be a 5% tax increase on, on the mentally retarded, and I think that's unfair. On the other hand, <coughs> one of the things Metro has done over right. the past five, six years is to lessen the need for access buses and gotten more people with disabilities onto regular buses. And any of us who ride buses right. know that people in wheelchairs, people with right. various disabilities, uh, and the drivers do an amazing job at right. facilitating those people getting on and off the buses right. and the riders, I am in really impressed. No, I've never heard anybody be impatient about how long it takes to lock down a wheelchair. So that's gotten people out of access yeah. and onto the bus system. The other thing I'd say about that is that in fact, Metro hasn't raised its fares for quite a while. That's not true. <clears throat> it's not true? No. They they what they they say they haven't raised their quote base fare but the base fare only applies in non rush hour and weekends okay well most people ride the bus during rush hour in fact they've raised rush hour rates repeatedly over the last 12 years they've raised transfer fees repeatedly but they've also done the other thing in the summer they've dropped those rush hour rates uh, to ridiculous levels. Well, they do discounts in the to, to save uh, smog and stuff. They've done discounts in the summer, sure, which is great. Uh, they also have, you know, the, the other thing that, that it is awful here is that they say they haven't raised rates. They, in fact, raised the rates on the disabled by 50% a year ago or six months ago. And, but yet the, they keep making these public relations uh, press conference claims that they haven't raised the rates in 12 years. It's just not true. Now, you've called for an audit. In fact, city council yeah, now right. has called for an audit. What right. will you be looking for? What will you be looking at in that audit? What do you want, what do you want audited? What I want audited is their uh, overhead and administrative costs. You know, for la let me give you an analogy. For the last three years, our administration told us that if we didn't raise property taxes, that we'd cut out garbage collection or snow removal or what have you. And for the last three years, we have pushed back and said, no, we believe we can cut from the top, if you will. And two years ago, we cut $2 million from the middle management group. This year, we cut 600000 from middle management uh, group in our budget. The city council had the political will to do that. Metro uh, claimed in justifying these uh, unbelievably high rate increases on the disabled that they, in fact, had cut 50 administrative positions over the last year, which, if was true, would have saved them a lot of money, and they'd, it would show that they were using good faith before raising rates on the riders. We have repeatedly asked for proof that they, in fact, cut these 50 positions. And the information we have been provided demonstrates the opposite, that, in yeah. fact, yeah, go ahead. And there is some information out yeah. there that right. you know, talks about specific salaries for specific people, and so it's this kind of thing. One thing I keep hearing you say, is the real problem you've got with the increase for the disabled as opposed to the increase for the average rider? Because I'm, I'm not sure no, I focused think, on that before. I think that I think that it's it's both, but the 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 increase that cries out for the greatest uh, relief okay. is, is the 300 percent increase for the disabled. I'm almost out of time, but yeah. I do want to extend a little bit here yeah. uh, and and ask a couple more questions. Yeah. If we keep cutting back on our bus system, I mean, don't we run the risk of 
of cutting service, cutting back, no. and ruining the whole thing at the very time when, when for the next 10 years, 20 years, we know energy costs are going to go way up. We should be trying to encourage people to get on those buses. Oh, aren't, we, aren't we going in the wrong direction no, here? I would argue we're going in the wrong direction because Metro wants it. We're, we're, they have admitted that if they raise the rates, ridership will actually it decline. Will. So I think it is a mistake for them to raise rates so dramatically uh, so quickly. Of course, over time, rates have to go up. Isn't the real issue here that we've got to find a better way to fund a countywide or a regional bus system? Aren't we really looking for leadership? to bring that issue back up rather than just pick away at Metro's current budget? Well, it's absolutely the case that we should have a countywide system. We're the only city in America where the central city pays for a regional bus system, and that's just fundamentally unfair. And it makes the city on the margin less competitive because because of that obligation right. we have, we have the highest earnings tax in a region, which makes us less competitive with, say, Blue Ash or Mason or Northern Kentucky. So absolutely that's the solution uh, long term. But in the short term, they shouldn't, they shouldn't fix – should, while they're not addressing those problems, which, by the way, on the contract, they have an obligation to seek funding from other areas. Yeah, we, yeah. They are then taking it out on the, on the disabled. And, and long, one final point on that. Okay. When we saved $2.5 million for social services that we just talked about, which I'm proud of, all that money goes through an agency which has overhead, and people do wonderful work in those areas. In this case, every cent we can convince Metro to reduce this proposed increase goes directly into the pocket of a low-income folk person who is going into the workforce, into the economy, and doesn't own a car and is going to be part of the American dream. So fighting to reduce this increase, I think, is a measure of economic justice that is something uh, worthy, and I'm going to continue the fight. Well, and this is going to go on, and right. you're going to be back, and Metro is going to be back here at some right. point. Thank you, John, You're for welcome. being here. Have a good Christmas. And uh, this time of the year, uh, family is time for celebrations and joy, unless you have a high school senior in your house. Then it's time to push, prod, and pray that the child finishes those college applications forms that have been sitting on their desk since June. After the break, some suggestions for staying sane during the college crunch. Welcome back. The emotional stress inflicted by the college application process reaches its peak in millions of households this time of the year. Your high school senior son or daughter is probably moodier than usual, if that's possible, and you are probably about to blow a gasket if they don't finish that application essay that has been within a day of completion since October. Given that, I thought it might be useful to talk with somebody on the other side. I am joined this morning by Mark Camille, the uh, Dean of Admissions at Xavier University. Mark, welcome to uh, Newsmakers. Thanks. Thanks. Um, we're now, I mean, there's lots of things we could talk about with this process, but we're really, let's focus on the seniors at the moment who have okay. to finish that application. Xavier's uh, due date for final application is February 1. Mm -hmm. um, what's your advice to that student family out there facing that essay and right. those, that part of the process? Well, I, you know, I guess, first of all, hopefully there's been some, some legwork that's taken place so far, and, and the oh research has happened and, and, and so on. And when the student gets to that point of applying and getting these applications ready, that's kind of when the stress, as you say, starts to set in. But I think as, as they're putting the finishing touches on that and, and working on essays, uh, I think the essay is, is one of the most important opportunities for a student as they're applying to colleges. Uh, oftentimes colleges will give a student a variety of choices that they can pick from to, to write their essay on and as Xavier I think we have four or five that they can pick from. And the essay is as I say it's an opportunity, it's that student's chance to tell a story that may not leap off of a transcript or may not be in, in the application. So it really does get read. It absolutely does get read and, and you know when we talk with our staff and the admission committee at Xavier you know we're reading the essay not necessarily with a red pen looking for grammatical mistakes and so forth but uh, you know there's there's some of that and I'll, I'll but but it's really the story. That how the much student... should parents be involved in that process and how much should it just really be the mm -hmm. students? I think it, it certainly providing guidance, um, providing some some 
impetus for the student, for instance, to write more than one draft. You know, I, I always tell students, write it and then put it down for a day or two and then come back to it. And I guarantee that they'll find something that they might want to say differently. Now, sure, run it by the parents, have them read it. But I think it's important that the essay represents the student's voice. We're not looking to admit mom or dad. We're looking to admit the son or the daughter. So it has to be true to their I voice. understand that there's also services out there now that you can pay somebody to take take you through the process or take your son or daughter through the process. Is there any data that says if you do that, if you spend money, it actually results in better, you get better results than you would otherwise? Not that I've seen, no. I think between the resources within the family, the parents, or maybe an older sibling that, that's gone on to college, and if, and if that's not available, guidance counselors. I mean, within the school systems, they've got guidance counselors, teachers who have all been through the process. Go to your before. favorite teacher. Absolutely. Go to your favorite teacher. Go to a friend who has an older brother or sister who's gone on to college. Uh, but I, 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 my own personal opinion, I don't think it's worth spending the extra money. And in some cases, that you're talking hundreds and thousands of dollars for these services. You know, there's al always the question of, you know, how many schools should I apply to? Right. Um, do you have a recommendation on, is there a guideline on that? Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's anything written in stone, but I, I, I think it's important to present yourself with options. So I always, when I'm talking with students, again, I think, you know, if you were to try to categorize it, for instance, you may want to have a REACH school, some place that as they've researched it, they think, well, this may be a little bit of a stretch. Uh, then to certainly have some schools that fall within their typical, you know, profile. And then a safety school is, is you know, a term that you'll hear a lot where they know they're going to be admitted. Uh, so I think, you know, three, four, five schools is probably a nice mix. You know, for an under, on the undergraduate level, I've seen this happen. I was a high school teacher, so I saw it happen with students. I saw it happen with friends, uh, children of, of friends of ours. They go and they get enthralled by some specialized program, international business someplace, and they have to go to that school. They get admitted and they find out they're going to change. You know, everybody changes their major five times anyway. Uh -huh. How much should you put on an individual yeah. program at a school? Right. I think that you bring up an important point, Dan. And, and, and first of all, some students, you're right, they're dead set. They know I'm going to major in architectural engineering. I've got to find that program. And for some students, they'll find it and track right through. But the majority of students, as you just mentioned, change their major at least once during their college career. And many change it at least twice. That's why I think variety and looking for breadth of opportunities, that's where I think the liberal arts come into play. Because they can be, you know, they can present students with so many opportunities to, that, to then branch off into a specific discipline. Yeah. And uh, final question. How has online application changed things? Well, certainly it's made it easier for students to apply. Uh, you know, not only in terms of convenience, you go online and pull it up, but also for some colleges, they'll waive the application fee if students apply online. We do it at Xavier, and frankly for us, the online application feeds directly into our database, so it eliminates the data entry piece. So for us, it's great if a student applies online. Uh, but it has. It's made it easier for students to apply. I'm going to now take off my serious reporter hat. Being a Xavier graduate myself, uh -huh. um, how have numbers changed for you over the past few years at Xavier? And, at and, and you know, what are the proportions, the number of people who apply to Xavier, the number of people who admit it, and the number right. of people who actually right. attend? Right. Yeah, we, we've had some fairly dramatic uh, change at Xavier in the last four or five years. Our applicant pool, uh, just in the last, well, let's say the last five years, uh, five years ago we received about 3,300 applications for a freshman class of 800. Uh, this past year we received just under 5,000 applications for that same freshman class of 800. So it's about one uh, in six? It, it, it is, and we anticipate the, the applicant pool this year is already running ahead considerably versus a year ago, so we may cross that 5,000 uh, level this year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we're still in a position uh, where we really do, as we're evaluating applications, we're looking for reasons to admit, not to deny. You know, our, our goal in the admission process is to find students who have the academic preparation to be successful at Xavier and have the background to be successful and make a good contribution to the university. Well, Mark, um, 
thank you for being here this morning. A lot of your work is still coming up here, but a lot of student work. And I think the basic thing is step back, enjoy Christmas, but get that essay finished. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for making Local 12 Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We leave you with some scenes of the elves who labored in the windows of Shilto's department store when I was young. Since being displaced from 7th and Race, a Boy Scout troop in Dan, Ohio has made a place for them. Have a good week.